Robert Maxwell, the billionaire media tycoon and one-time publisher of the Daily Mirror and the New York Daily News, moved into football in the early 1980s. In 1982, he'd bought and bankrolled Oxford United, and he'd also taken a 19% stake in its near neighbour, Reading. Both teams sat in the third level of English football, and neither were setting the world alight. But Maxwell had a plan to fix that. On the 16th of April 1983, while Oxford were playing away at Doncaster, Maxwell went on BBC Radio Oxford and announced his plan to merge the club with Reading. Everything in the world that cannot pay its way must go the way of the merger to combine into stronger units. If we in Thames Valley are to retain a league club, we've got to unite Reading and Oxford. And the result, in Maxwell's mind at least, would be the Thames Valley Royals, a combination of the geographical area and Reading's nickname. A new stadium somewhere between the two cities was floated. Possible sites included the small town of Didcot and the even smaller town of Wallingford, which was almost equidistant between the two, but which barely had a population of 10,000 people. Now, not surprisingly, given that Maxwell owned the club outright, Oxford United's board of directors unanimously backed the idea, only pausing to suggest that the new club be called Thames Valley United. But the local press and fans of both clubs were appalled. As Mike Habits, chairman of the Reading Supporters Club, said, Our fans can't stand Oxford fans, and I can't see them travelling to Oxford to watch the new team. And the feeling was, of course, mutual. On the other hand, the then chairman of the Football League, Jack Dunnett, thought it was a bold and imaginative move, which I'll be watching with interest. Now, not everyone thought it was bold and imaginative. Roger Smee, who played 50 games for Reading in the late 1960s, had been putting his post-retirement skills in business to good use. Reviewing the previous year's club accounts, he saw that Frank Waller, the club chairman, and his allies on the Reading board didn't actually have such a firm grip on the club at the time. In fact, they'd only recently acquired control of the club by issuing additional shares to themselves, a move that Smee thought very illegal. Teaming up with Roger Tranter, a member of the Reading board who opposed the merger, they began legal proceedings and got a temporary injunction from the High Court, preventing any further trading in Reading shares. Maxwell, in typical high bluster mode, called it a sideshow and said that the merger would proceed. Oxford's first home game since the merger had been proposed saw 2,000 fans stage a sit-down protest on the Manor ground pitch, delaying the game by half an hour. Banners reading Judas were prominently displayed in front of Maxwell's seats. Oxford then beat Wigan 2-0. Two days later, though, Maxwell was back on the offensive. In an interview with BBC Radio Oxford, he said of the protesters, if they want to become supporters of someone else, they are entirely welcome. And more ominously, if the deal does not go through, both Reading and Oxford will be dead before the beginning of the next season. Nothing short of the end of the earth will prevent this from going through. And it appeared that Maxwell was right, with the Reading board, led by Frank Waller, voting to back the merger proposal. Later that day, however, Reading supporters marched from the town centre to their old Elm Park Stadium home to protest the move, and then watched their team draw 3-3 with Millwall. And next, in a remarkable quirk of scheduling, Oxford and Reading met at Oxford's manor ground. The home fans held another protest before the game and then saw their team lose 2-1 to the visitors which hardly improved the local mood. This all happened just a short distance from Maxwell's palatial rented mansion, Headington Hill Hall. Tranter and Smee's case was heard in the High Court, and the judge, Mr Justice Harmon, agreed that the Reading Board had acted illegally and issued a new injunction which prevented any buying or selling of shares in Reading for six weeks. And when the Reading Board met again, Waller resigned with he and his clique returning the disputed unissued shares to the club. The local press was delirious, with the Reading Evening Post gleefully reporting the end of the road for Maxwell. We've won, merger off, read their front page. Of course, none of this had been helping Reading's form, and on the last day of the season they needed to beat Wrexham and for other results to go their way to have any chance of avoiding relegation. Reading won 1-0, but they went down anyway. Oxford fared much better. They actually finished fifth, but just missed out on promotion to the old second division. And neither club would go out of business. 
Reading shareholders would go on to vote against the Maxwell bid, and still under Maxwell's control, Oxford would actually win successive promotions and also win the League Cup in 1986. Contrary to his claim, a merger hadn't been necessary. In fact, both clubs outlived him after he was found overboard his luxury yacht just off the Canary Islands in November 1991. If you like this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. The Athletic brings you the best sports journalism in the world in a personalised experience, connecting you with the stories and teams that you care about the most. There's coverage of 13 sports, plus direct access to world-class journalists through live Q&As, discussions and podcasts. Not to mention, it's all ad-free. And you can try it now for free for 30 days by clicking the link in the description.